welcome. Welcome to Metaview United Methodist Church, 768 Summit Road in North Carolina. Thank you for joining with us today, whether it's uh, presence in-house or whether you're watching our video of our service today. <coughs> for our announcements, our mission statement, we will share with others all that we know of God, Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit showing God's love and care. We encourage people to wear their mask and distance themselves and just uh, stay as safe as you possibly can. We need to continue to reach out to others so that people know that we really do miss them, we care about them, and uh, just, just let them know that uh, we're thinking about them. I'll keep First Methodist in Draper in your prayers for their closing. We'll continue with our worship services on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, right on down the road. So we invite uh, our, our members, attenders, uh, the community to, to come and join with us as you feel comfortable. Uh, we're thinking about uh, bingo and when we need to start that back up. And uh, I'll uh, find out more information about that the next few days. Uh, we certainly welcome new members as they come our way. We've got a, a couple of new members that we're waiting to, to come, and we're very thankful for that. Uh, when we finish, if you'll just put your uh, hymn book in the pew rack there where you're sitting, I'll uh, sanitize them before next Sunday. Uh, you're receiving a budget sheet today. Uh, next Sunday, I will give you the goals that we set back in October, or the officers of the church, maybe both if I get real, real busy this week. But uh, uh, all this information was finalized back in October when we had our charge conference. Do we have any announcements we need to share this morning? Anybody have a birthday or an anniversary? this past week or this coming week. Please join with me as we say together our call to worship. Sing praises to the Lord. O oh, you his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen. Our first hymn is found on page uh, 577, God of grace and God of glory, and you can either sit or stand as you feel comfortable. Again, 577.
Please join with me as we say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick of the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This time, Nick's going to share with us our next hymn, Sanctuary. But I don't have the words for you, but uh, you might already know the words. Oh Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. Pause for our meditation and our prayers. <clears throat> Dear Father, you are an awesome God. And we are so thankful 
that we can call you Father, that we are your children. Be with all of those that are sick, those that we've named, those that may even be present today, that, that has needs and others that you know about, but maybe we don't even know about. Strengthen them, remove their pain, just, just help them to, to regain their health if that is within your will, Father. Be with those that are grieving, bring peace and comfort, just help them to to move forward the best they can. Be with those that are struggling financially. Just help them to be able to, to survive and, and have food and clothes and a place for shelter. Help people to, to want to have jobs. So many people today are receiving unemployment and some of those are satisfied with what they're getting and don't want to work. Help all of us, Lord, to, to, to have a desire to be self-sufficient and, and goal-oriented and, and actually work. Lord, be with our churches. <clears throat> There's so many needs around us. Help us to be able to reach out as, as we're able to in this very difficult pandemic that we're involved with. Lord, continue to bless us just as you've always done. Help us to share these blessings with others. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Remind those that are not with us in our sanctuary today that uh, if you would send your offerings to Diane Carter for the use of our church, that would be very helpful. Uh, Nick is going to do our special music. Here I am to worship. No. 
bowed down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, you're all together worthy, you're all together wonderful, you're wonderful to me. Beautiful song, and certainly, God, it is wonderful. Thanks for reminding all that God does for us and the fact that He does deserve to be worshipped. For our scripture today, I'm reading from Luke, the 24th chapter, verses 36 through 48. I'm reading from the King James Version. <coughs> Again, Luke 24, beginning with verse 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and a, a, a frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit doth not flesh and bones as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And the father were yet believed not for joy and wonder, he said unto them, have you here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of honeycomb. And he did take it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you, which I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, concerning me. Then opened he his, their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them thus, it, it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, <coughs> and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things, the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I can't unsee that. Have you ever spoken or, or thought or of some version of, of that phrasing, I can't unsee that. These days it often refers to some stupid or inane thing that has shown up on our computer or Facebook or YouTube or whatever the most popular social media site is at the moment. Someone you know or even a complete stranger has forwarded a bit of video when you clicked on it. All at once you saw something you wish that you had never seen. But you can't really unsee it. And so you're stuck with that thought or those images rolling around in your head for the next few hours or days or even months. So we try to fill our minds with other things and, and hope that what we saw will just fade away. I want to unsee it. Maybe you've been at the wrong place at the wrong time. And now you've been called as a witness to a crime. It's a lot of bother going to court, rearranging your schedule. It's inconvenient, and depending on who the defendant is, it may even be dangerous. I wish 
had never even seen it, we might say. We are witnesses of these things, Jesus said to the disciples before his ascension. What did that mean for the disciples? And what does it mean for you and me? Today we're going to consider what it means as followers of Christ that we are witnesses to the resurrection. If you heard that a close friend or a family member had come back from the dead, you would understand the question of sanity and reliability of the person telling it to you. You would have to see the person with your own eyes, and even then a lot of questions would have to be answered. Last August, a woman who was declared dead at her suburban Detroit home opened her eyes in the funeral home as she was about to be embalmed. Now, this was on CBS News, August the 25th, 2020. Found unresponsive at the home. <clears throat> Paramedics have been called and they tried for 30 minutes to revive her with no success. An emergency room doctor was consulted and agreed with the paramedics and she was pronounced dead. More than an hour later, as she was about to be embalmed, she opened her eyes and she was rushed to the hospital. Can you imagine the stories the witness had to tell? Things like that just don't happen. Luke tells us it took three events for the disciples to believe Jesus was alive. In the first, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and other women had gone back to the tomb with spices that they had prepared for Jesus' body. They found that the stone was rolled away. Two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. They asked the women, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. That's Luke 24, 5. And when the women returned and told the eleven all that they had seen, the women's words seemed like an idle tale, and they didn't believe them. Luke 24, 11. The second event, Luke records, takes place on the road to Emmaus, that's Luke 24, 13 through 35. Jesus walked next to two men that were discussing the thing that had happened in Jerusalem. As they talked, Jesus said, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures, Luke 24, 27. Later, as Jesus joined them at the table, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. And they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Luke 24, 30 and 31. They returned to Jerusalem to tell the eleven all the things that had happened to them. The eleven didn't believe these witnesses either. Or at a minimum, they weren't convinced. But then the third event occurred while the eleven were talking with the two men from Emmaus. Jesus stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. They thought they were seeing a ghost. Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself, Jesus said. Touch me and see it as a ghost. Not that they don't have flesh or, or bones that you see that I have. He showed them his hands and his feet and while they were still disbelieving he asked them if they had anything to eat. When offered a, a piece of fish he took it and ate in their presence. Did Jesus have a smile on his face when the recognition finally began to set in? We don't know. 
But surely there was a friendly face the disciples never expected to see alive again in this life. He began to teach them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he, be he began what must have been the greatest Bible study of all time. Can you imagine people crowded into public auditoriums to hear a best-selling author talk about his or her latest book, hear the author of the universe was explaining things to them about his ministry and about their mission to the world. Jesus went on to talk about his role as Messiah and the things that had to happen as he fulfilled that role. That the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations. And then came the clincher. You are witnesses of these things. Not you can be witnesses. Not you should be witnesses. Not you can choose to be witnesses. You are witnesses. They could not unsee what they had seen. And because of that, they had a responsibility for the rest of their lives to continue being witnesses. Jesus continued, See, I am sending you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Luke 24, 49. In a short time, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descended upon them and they began the work of being witnesses. Carolyn Lewis, a professor of preaching at Luther Seminary, says of this passage, as it turns out, witnessing is not voluntary. It's a state of being. This is an internet article that she wrote. We are witnesses. We are witnesses. It's who we are. It's what we are. It's what we were made for. For some, it's not good news. We remember when we have not worn that job and that title very well. We remember when we have deferred the task of witnessing to someone else. We know sometimes probably more than we like to admit. We've not been a good witness for Christ. What we have to realize, however, is that we are never not a witness. So when we turn our backs on the opportunities that God gives us to be witnesses, we nevertheless continue to witness, just not as the best and most effective witness. Perhaps even a witness against what God can and wants to do in our lives, in the lives of God's people. Either way, we are witnesses. We are witnesses in all that you and I do every day. When people know we are believers, they will check us out. Mark was a businessman at the beginning of his career. He had a growing family and a, a meager salary, and he asked a friend at church about airport parking for an upcoming trip. Every dollar he spent on travel came out of his pocket, and he was always looking for ways to save. The friend recommended one of the parking companies and told them it was possible to get a free stay after so many trips. He said he could give him a voucher to use, but it was not quite above board. The young man said he would manage on his own. He didn't feel right about doing anything that was questionable. The friend smiled and said he was glad to hear that his faith was not for sale. We're witnesses, and others are watching to see 
if God really makes a difference in our lives and in our faith. We are witnesses in business, in school, in marriage, in our families, as parents, as children, in our hobbies, and even in sports. In all of life, we are witnesses. We can make lots of excuses to why we should set aside our witnessing from time to time. But these excuses don't hold water. We're witnesses that every day we should look for the best way to witness to our faith and bear witnesses for Christ and the resurrection in every way we can. Shortly after the day of Pentecost, Peter healed a crippled man. This prompted people to gather around him. John at Solomon's portico Peter arose to the occasion, preaching a good word for the resurrected Christ. Referring to the resurrection, Peter said, To this we are witnesses. Acts 3.15 That's true for all of us. To this we are witnesses. Go out and let your witness be known. I came across a, uh, an interesting uh, illustration on the computer and it's about our faith and in order to witness we have to have faith. It's a story about a, a midwestern town that was experiencing a, a really bad drought. Crops were dying and the livelihood of this farm town was threatened. A local pastor decided to hold a prayer service and he asked all the folks people to, to come to the service that were instructed to bring with them symbols of faith that God would deliver them. People showed up with rosaries, statues of Mary, crosses, prayer books, Bibles, crucifixes, holy oil. All came forward and shared their symbols and prayed for God to send rain. And finally there was one small little girl left without hesitation. She came to the front, and slowly she opened up her symbol of faith, a brightly colored umbrella. She knew what it meant to expect something from God. Let us pray, Lord. Help us, just as that little girl had faith. Help us to have faith that same level and intensity of faith. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our closing hymn today, Here I Am, Lord, is 593.
Are you open to being sent by God out into the world as a witness? I thank you for being here today. And we thank our people watching by video uh, for continuing to be with us. And uh, we certainly want to continue to, to serve God. Go forth in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.